You feel ready. <laughs> In the uh, last lecture of this series, I talked about the importance of distinguishing between physical realities based on indisputable evidence and inner personal realities that are based on beliefs. And somebody said that he would not believe anything that could not be demonstrated. Now, a different viewpoint on that is that if something can be demonstrated, it must be part of the physical reality, and there would be no need to believe in it. So the big difference between inner personal reality and outer physical reality is their degree of malleability. Malleability, <laughs> what a word. It, it means the degree that something can be shaped or influenced, malleable. And you can shape personal reality by changing your mind. But to shape physical reality requires planning and effort. Now the good news is that the vast majority of those things that determine your life experience, beliefs, motivations, and goals, are elements of inner personal reality. So what I'm saying is that you are an intelligent creature who can reacquire the state of creator in regard to your personal reality. Now, if some transparent belief generates experiences that you don't prefer, you have the power within you to change it. You can change your I can'ts into I could's if I wants to. <laughs> That's the way Papa I would say it. <laughs> and if you've done Avatar, you know that there is a step-by-step -step process for tracing back from undesirable experiences to the underlying beliefs that are generating the experience. And that there is an effective and swift methodology for changing the beliefs if you choose to. One of the things that is repeatedly stressed in Avatar is that the choice of what you believe or what you change is yours. And that's why we began these talks with the path to personal responsibility. And part of this responsibility journey is learning to control your own mind and to acquire wisdom about what beliefs lead people to happiness and what beliefs lead people to suffering. I mean, that's the basic lesson of your life. Now, experience with the physical universe leads to knowledge. Experience with beliefs leads to wisdom. And as I promised in an earlier talk, here are some broad guidelines for choosing beliefs. 
for at least 10,000 years and probably a lot longer, wise men and women have taught that beliefs motivated by forgiveness and kindness lead to happiness and that beliefs motivated by revenge and selfishness lead to suffering. And history has repeatedly tested this thesis and pretty much confirmed it. So this is the first thing that you should consider in deliberately choosing what beliefs to put your faith in and what beliefs to discreate. And you just ask, why do I choose to believe this? Now inspect your own motivations. And this is best done with a resolve to be completely honest. Look for what your motivation was in the moment before you chose the belief or accepted the belief from someone else. Now generally speaking, beneficial beliefs are motivated by the prediction of future consequences. And harmful beliefs are motivated by justification of past events. I say generally speaking because both beneficial and harmful beliefs can be contagious, can become indoctrinations accepted by the majority of a generation without event. Another thing for you to consider in managing your beliefs is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If everyone chose to believe what you believe, would the amount of suffering in the world increase or decrease? And the third thing, and this one can spare you from destructive emotions, is to deliberately believe that any misfortune that you experience is the result of actions you have done in the past. Wow. At first, this may seem like it's just too great a burden, you know, or that it's letting a victimizer off the hook. But really, it frees you completely from the blame game. And at best, it turns your suffering into a lesson. And at worst, it's, it's an honorable settling of a karmic debt. And either is better than flailing helplessly in the trap of victim consciousness. Full responsibility is a source belief, and it increases the possibility of self-healing and of living deliberately. Now remember, no one is arguing for the truth of the statement that you are totally responsible for everything that happens to you. It's a hypothesis. The truth is, I don't know, and neither do you. I mean, life can get weird. What I am saying is this, believing that this statement is true will lead to less suffering than surrendering to the idea that you're a victim. You stay forgiving, responsive to others, and the truth will take care of itself. Among self-sabotaging beliefs, beliefs that place the cause of your life experience beyond your control are at the top of the list. And some other self-sabotaging beliefs are beliefs that seek happiness at the expense of another or beliefs that deny your obligations, uh, and beliefs that minimize the importance of ethical conduct or spiritual practice. 
And as the last bit of advice on taking personal responsibility for your beliefs is this. Compare the consequences of holding one belief with the consequences of holding its opposite. And when I first started computer programming, one of the most difficult things I had to come to grips with was that there were many ways to code the same thing. And there wasn't one right answer. I was looking for some kind of instruction that said, this is how you do it. One right answer. But what I found was that there were many different ways of getting to the same result. Now, there are rare cases in the physical universe where there's only one way or one procedure or one formula that will produce a specific result. But the same is not true for consciousness. And only one answer solutions should always be suspected. Believing that there is only one right belief leads to dogma, uh, indoctrination, and intolerance. It doesn't lead to wisdom. In the universe of mind, there are as many right answers as there are viewpoints. And creating only one answer is just lazy. <laughs> it's also dangerous because it locks you into one inflexible viewpoint. One belief, one viewpoint. It's all you get. And one of the duties of avatar wizards is to perform an ongoing assessment of society's belief choices. Does life run better if people believe this? Or does life run better if people believe that? And truth is not the issue. The issue is what people believe. Which, in a roundabout way, brings us to the subject of this talk, which is entitled, The Path to Compassion. Now, the goal of this path is to open a connection between the feelings of heart consciousness and the reasoning power of the intellect. The feelings of heart consciousness, love, empathy, kindness, patience, tolerance, and so on, as a group can be labeled compassion. And developing compassion is breaking through the selfishness that dominates reason. Compassion means sharing someone's suffering. And it's a transition from what do I want to how can I help. I once uh, attended a meditation retreat in upstate New York. Uh, the organizer was Swami Chad, who was a psychotherapist who had left his practice to study Hindu yoga. And the program required that each student meditate from 6 in the morning to 9 o'clock at night and breaks were only allowed for a bathroom and a light noon meal. And the goal was to put in 40 hours of seated meditation in three days. Now, during this period, everyone agreed not to speak to anyone other than to the Swami, and only when he addressed you with a tap on your knee. So. On the first day, Swami Chad instructed us to sit quietly on our pillows and meditate on the location of our consciousness. Now, to me, this was a little bit like trying to lift myself by my own shoelaces. Yeah. And after I struggled with it for eight hours, you know, punctuated with naps and daydreams, 
the Swami squatted in front of me and he patted my knee and asked me with a gentle smile, how are you doing? And I took the opportunity to quote something I'd once read. Hmm. The eye that sees cannot see itself. I felt very smug, <laughs> like I'd figured it out. <clears throat> College graduate, you know. And he smiled, shook his head yes, and said, OK, which meant no, keep trying. <laughs> He patted me on the knee again, and he, he expanded the instruction. Locate your consciousness without thinking or looking. <laughs> oh, without thinking or looking, I thought. Uh, he should have told me that to begin with. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. He was wasting my time with incomplete instructions. And, and I felt this flood of blame arise in my mind, which wasn't the first time I'd experienced it. <laughs> but it was so clear and completely separate from me this time. Wow. That's what a blaming mind looks like, huh? <laughs> so I sat for another three hours thinking about my resentment until I realized that I was probably wearing grooves in my brain or something. <laughs> then I started thinking about not thinking. <laughs> and then looking at not looking. and dreaming about a redhead in my history class. <laughs> I thought about leaving, but then I imagined what a blow that would be to my reputation. And that led to a fantasy about God appearing to everyone and announcing that I was the chosen one. <laughs> which directly led back to thoughts about the redhead. <laughs> I see we've got some meditators here. <laughs> so day one, interesting, but no real progress on locating the source of my consciousness. On day two, I discovered leg cramps. <laughs> and I was wondering if I might be inadvertently crippling myself for life. <laughs> and that was pretty much my concern for day two. On the third day of the retreat, just as I was about to give up, I suddenly stopped thinking and started feeling. Here. <laughs> here. I mean, consciousness is, is here. Right here, right now. You know? Wow. Everything is here, right now. Everything, the past, the future. Right now, you know, right now. I think a halo must have appeared around my head, you know. And this time when the Swami patted my knee, he didn't even ask how I was doing. He just smiled, let me to enjoy the here and now. And I understood why at the moment of enlightenment, Buddha touched the ground. He's going, here, here. <laughs> And for the rest of the day, the, the here got wider and wider, and the now got slower and slower. And I experienced unconditional love as a state of being 
rather than as an idea. Loving precious humanity as an experience, as a state of being. Oh, and I cried like a baby at <laughs> this overwhelming compassion and just raised from my heart. I think there's uh, some magic in slowing down that causes consciousness to move from the head to the heart. And vice versa, I imagine. I was aware of this movement as a literal fact rather than as a poetic metaphor. I mean, my perceptions were being translated in the chest area rather than in the brain. My heart opened. I was at the heart of the matter. I experienced heartfelt compassion. I fell into the sacred heart. I had a song in my heart. I left my heart in San Francisco. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I lost my heart to metaphor madness. <laughs> okay, I'm through. <clears throat> Cross my heart. <laughs> In Hinduism, heart consciousness is called Anahata, which is the name of the chakra in the heart region, Anahata. And according to their belief, the heart is the center of compassion, altruism, forgiveness, and non-judgmental acceptance. And it's this heart consciousness where unconditional love manifests and where personal responsibility arises from and where people engage in selfless kindness toward each other. Let me read you something written by the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. We say you know it in the head, but you don't know it in the heart. There's an extraordinary distance from the head to the heart, a distance of 10, 20, 30 years, or a lifetime. You can know something in the head for 40 years, and it may never have touched the heart, but only when you have realized it in the heart you really begin to take notice of it. When consciousness orients itself with the heart instead of the brain, people change. You know, doing feel it is an orientation to heart consciousness. We touch our head, you know, to signal an intellectual process. But when we touch the heart region, it signals a spiritual process. The head is intellect. It communicates with words and uh, emotional reactions. And its basic motivation is to solve problems and deal with fear. But the heart is spirit. It communicates with empathy, feel it. And its basic motivation is to connect to contribute, and to express love. The intellect focuses on matters of survival and social status. The heart focuses on ethical matters and compassion. The self of the intellect is the ego. The self of the heart is the spirit, or higher self. And the connection between head consciousness and heart consciousness, or between ego and spirit, is called the path of compassion. Head is me consciousness. Heart is higher self consciousness. Head is reason. Heart is feeling. 
Head is mortal. Heart is eternal. Wholeness is experiencing the connection between these two extremes. Now, a person operates most successfully when he or she has deliberate access to both of these modes of consciousness. Head without heart is brutish and selfish. Heart without head is naive and reckless. But together, they inspire people to ethical, sane behaviors. The integration of head and heart give rise to a moral conscience. Heart directed by head and head restrained by heart are optimum conditions for creating an enlightened planetary civilization. The obstructions on this head-heart path are addressed on the integrity course and on the professional course and in the wizard's materials. And the obstructions consist of misunderstandings, misidentifications, indoctrination, and transgressions. Let's do the compassion exercise together and see if you experience any movement on this path from head consciousness to heart consciousness. First, select a person in the room, can be a friend or a stranger, preferably someone you can see, and it's fine if you want to run it on the person next to you or in front of you. It's a non-vocal exercise, and the results I'd like you to focus on are what you get from running the exercise rather than on the results of having it run on you, okay? Are you set? Source beings? So with attention on the person, repeat to yourself, just like me, this person is seeking some happiness for his or her life. With attention on the person, repeat to yourself, just like me, this person is trying to avoid suffering in his or her life. With attention on the person, repeat to yourself, just like me, this person has known sadness, loneliness, and despair. And with attention on the person, repeat to yourself, just like me, this person is seeking to fill his or her needs. And finally, with attention on the person, repeat to yourself, just like me, this person is learning about life. Can I see a show of hands of how many of you have experienced some movement from head to heart? Yeah, good. That's most of you. Here's some, uh, here's some more techniques that various religions and spiritual practices have used to move people on this path from head to heart. First is meditation. For example, meditating upon the kindness of your mother. I mean, she took care of you. She fed you. 
She kept you safe when you were helpless. How do you repay her for giving you human birth? And think of the many kindnesses and sacrifices that your mother made for you. Does that open your heart? Another practice is breathing exercises. Most of the breathing exercises have the goal of making your breathing deeper and slower. And when that happens, the body cleanses itself, blood pressure drops, and consequently the heart relaxes and opens up. Another practice is chanting mantras. These are sounds that cause energy movement in, in and around the body. One of my favorites is Om Mani Padmi Hum. And the tonal vibrations of this mantra balance energies in the mind and body. And as the mind and body relax, again the heart opens. Now there's some mantras that are just devotional. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. is a Christian devotional mantra. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya is a Hindu devotional mantra. And they both awaken heart consciousness. Now there are many compassion practices that are based on devotion. In this sense, devotion means to give up or surrender the ego to a divine influence. And the divine influence comes through the heart. And devotion includes all kinds of rituals, prayers, dancing, singing, or any selfless activity that moves consciousness from the head to the heart. And once the heart path is open, confession and forgiveness will keep it open and head and heart consciousness will begin to integrate. Now I know I covered a lot of ground in this talk, but I hope that something I have said has touched your spirit. Be well and continue to contribute to the creation of an enlightened planetary civilization and I'll see you at Wizards. Thank you.